Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous videos, we talked about filtration at the glomerulus. We talked about uh, tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion in the proximal convoluted tubules and the loop of Henle. And what we mention in particular about the proximal convoluted tubule and the loop of Henle is that we have what's called obligatory water reabsorption. So remember what obligatory water reabsorption is. So whenever we absorb, in particular sodium, from the tubules back into the blood, water actually follows it. We really don't have to do anything for water to be reabsorbed. We're really just especially in the proximal convoluted tubule, we're really concerned about reabsorbing these goodies like glucose, amino acids, some small proteins or peptides, vitamins, and then of course ions. But of course when we absorb things like sodium from the tubule back into the capillary system, we have water that is just obliged to follow. It automatically follows because water follows salt. You have to remember that. We have something similar in the loop of Henle. Again, this whole thing involves countercurrent multiplication, but we have reabsorption of ions and then water follows. Again, we really don't have to do anything. Water just osmosis out because it goes where the salt is. Okay? Now, when we look at the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts, what we're going to see is that water reabsorption here is not obligatory. In fact, we have something called facultative water reabsorption. Okay? And that just basically means it's hormonally regulated. So as we went through the proximal convoluted tubule and the loop of Henle, we really just sort of had a baseline reabsorption and then also some baseline secretion. But what happens if we need to reabsorb more things or we need to secrete more things? Well, those ought to be hormonally regulated. And so we can choose if there's excess of, let's say, some of these wastes, we can actually secrete more of them into the distal convoluted tubule. And then if we actually, for some reason, have to get more sodium or more calcium or some of these other things, then we can choose to reabsorb more of them. So in contrast to these previous two sections, the PCT and the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts are hormonally regulated. We can actually alter the amount significantly of what's reabsorbed and secreted there. So let's first look at the distal convoluted tubule, then we'll look at the collecting ducts, and then we'll look at their histology. Okay, so the distal convoluted tubule, we can see here, first of all, that we have only a little bit that's actually reabsorbed here, but these things are actually going to be mostly hormonally regulated. Uh, two of the most important things we see here are sodium and calcium, and then of course there's going to be water. Okay, now. The first way that we can regulate what's reabsorbed from the distal convoluted tubule is through one hormone called aldosterone. We're going to talk about this later when we talk about the RAS system, which is a hormonal system that regulates fluid volume. But when aldosterone is released, it actually will trigger sodium reabsorption from the distal convoluted tubule. Okay? So whenever sodium is reabsorbed, it moves from the tubule into the capillary. This is actually the paratubular capillary right here. And then, of course, that gives us more sodium. Okay? The other thing that aldosterone does is it actually causes potassium to be secreted. So it's going to go the opposite direction. So potassium, when there's excess of it, it'll be in the blood right here. And aldosterone will trigger the secretion of potassium from the blood and then into the tubule, and it will be eliminated in urine. Okay? So aldosterone causes those two things, sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion. Now, as that as sodium is being reabsorbed, water is going to follow it. Now, again, it's not obligatory water reabsorption. It's facultative because it's hormonally regulated. Water won't just be reabsorbed from there uh, unless you have some trigger for it to do so. And that trigger is aldosterone, which causes sodium reabsorption, and then water follows. So regardless where you are, the water follows the salt. But here, it's regulated okay, very strongly by hormones. Right? And also notice, as we're reabsorbing more water, notice what's happening to the osmolarity as we go from the ascending loop of Henle to the collecting ducts. We go from 100 to 150 to 200 to 250 to 300. And again, 
you can, this, these numbers can be altered depending on the levels of aldosterone and so on and so forth. But if we were to have a lot of aldosterone, we'd have a lot of sodium reabsorption and a lot of water that would follow, and so we could even concentrate this more. But this is a very general set of numbers here. But notice as you go from the initial part to the final part, the osmolarity is increasing because you're reabsorbing all this stuff, particularly the sodium and then the water. Now another hormone that acts here is parathyroid hormone, or PTH. Recall this from the skeletal chapter. So PTH was important in maintaining blood calcium. Uh, it doesn't just act on the bones and cause resorption there. It will actually trigger reabsorption from the distal convoluted tubule. So if you have parathyroid hormone here, it'll trigger calcium to be reabsorbed from the tubule here back into the blood. And that will actually increase blood calcium levels because calcium is critical for tons of biological processes, including muscle contraction and then also blood clotting. Okay? And also we can see other things here that are also reabsorbed from the DCT. In, other than sodium and calcium, we also have some chloride reabsorption, bicarbonate, and then of course water, which mainly is going to follow that sodium. Okay? And again, there is some other secretion here that happens as well. If we have excess acid in the blood, hydrogen ions can be secreted and then we'll go into the urine. We already mentioned potassium. If there's excess of that, aldosterone will trigger more secretion of that potassium from the blood into the tubules. And then also excess ammonia. Ammonia is toxic, so if there's excess of that for whatever reason, such as in the case of amino acid breakdown, if that's elevated, we can have secretion of that ammonia into the tubule system, and then that stuff will eventually go into the collecting duct. Right? Now, in the collecting ducts, really the major thing that's happening there is more water reabsorption. This is really the major site of water reabsorption. Okay. So if you need to concentrate the urine more, meaning you need to get more water back into the blood, let's say if your fluid volume is low, then you need to get that water especially from the collecting ducts. All right. So again, we have facultative reabsorption here. It's hormonally regulated. And the major hormone that's going to act at the collecting ducts is antidiuretic hormone or ADH. So if you have ADH elevated in the blood, it's usually because you have a low fluid volume. And by negative feedback, you need to get that fluid volume back up, meaning you need to get water back into the blood. And so what ADH will actually do is it will cause aquaporins to move into the walls of the collecting ducts. Okay? So aquaporins are proteins that allow water to move through. Um, if these aquaporins are not here, we really don't get water moving into the blood. So when you have aquaporins that insert into the collecting duct, water then moves from the duct and then ultimately into the blood. And this serves to bring back the fluid volume or blood volume back up to normal levels. Okay? And it also makes the urine more concentrated. So for example, if you were to drink a lot of water throughout the day, what usually happens is your urine is clear. Right? But if you've been dehydrated throughout the day, most likely your ADH levels are elevated because you're dehydrated, you haven't been drinking a lot of water, and what do you notice about your urine? It's very yellow. That's because this ADH that's, trig that's released whenever you have low fluid volume, if you're dehydrated, that ADH causes these aquaporins to move into the walls of the collecting ducts, and then water is reabsorbed back into the blood, saving that water. And notice through the collecting ducts, we can have the concentration or osmolarity, I should say, of the filtrate, which will eventually be urine, go from 300 all the way up to 1,200. And this number can also change drastically as well, depending on our level of hydration. If we're dehydrated, um, then we're going to reabsorb this water, and the urine will be very concentrated. If we're hyperhydrated, if we already have plenty of water and we're trying to get rid of it, then this number won't be as high because we don't need to reabsorb that water. We actually need to get rid of it. Okay. And from here, I'll just mention that these, the fluid in these collecting ducts are going to ultimately move into the minor calyx. Um, the collecting ducts are going to kind of fuse together, so to speak, into what's called a minor calyx, which will then go to a major calyx and then ultimately to the renal pelvis, the ureter, and the bladder. And we'll talk about that um, more in another video. What I want to do now is switch gears and look at the histology of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts. So now let's take a look at some microscope images of the distal convoluted tubule 
and we'll look at the collecting ducts as well. So right here again, let's reorient with this nephron. This right here, right in the center, this is our glomerulus. And actually, we can see a few others. There's one right here, one right here, one right here. I may have gone off the screen a little bit, but hopefully at this point, you can at least recognize the glomerulus. Okay. Um, you can see actually the, the capsular wall right here. And then we see all these tubule systems around it. Now remember from the video on the proximal convoluted tubule, the way you recognize that tubule, there's actually one right here and then another one right here. Notice that the inside, the lumen of it, looks cloudier. It looks like it has some gunk in it almost. If you look at these two right here, uh, that's not actually gunk, it just that's what it looks like. Also, if you look at these epithelial cells that line it, they actually look to be a little bit darker. Their cytoplasm looks a little bit darker um, and maybe even a little bit thicker. Here's a good region of the proximal convoluted tubule right here. Again, the lumen looks gunky, cloudy, looks like it's you know clogged up, so to speak. If we compare that to all this stuff over here on the left side, this is all distal convoluted tubule. We compare that, we notice that the lumen of the DCTs are actually a lot clearer looking, and even the cells that line the lumen, these epithelial cells, their cytoplasm actually looks to be a little bit brighter, actually. Okay. So again, these over here, kind of all around the left side, even approaching the right over here, this is all distal convoluted tubule. Okay. Again, lumens a lot clearer looking. Um, and also, if we look actually right here at this distal convoluted tubule right here, okay. We see a region over here where the cells kind of look a little bit darker. Um, I would actually speculate, and it's hard to tell exactly, these would probably be the macula densa cells, probably in this area right here, because remember, the distal convoluted tubule kind of loops back up and makes contact with the renal corpuscle, which is where the glomerulus is. Okay. Um, again, it's hard to tell exactly, but a lot of times when you see a distal convoluted tubule that's kind of in contact with the renal corpuscle, some of the darker regions around it um, are actually going to be macula densa cells. Okay. These macula densa cells are going to be cells that act as salt sensors. Um, if you haven't uh, watched or learned about the juxtaglomerular apparatus, um, that's where we talk about that. Uh, but again, these are probably the macula densa cells right here of the DCT. Okay. So in this image right here, this is a very blown up image of probably just one renal pyramid. Um, if you look at the bottom here, this would be the cortex. Um, if I were to zoom in here, we probably will be able to see um, a few glomeruli. Um, you can actually see one right here. There's a glomerulus. I mean, you can see them all over the place. So that's the cortex. Um, zooming back out, if we go in, of course, this would be where the medulla is. And we know there's several things in the medulla, such as the loop of Henle that actually dips down into the medulla. And if we go far enough, we should be able to see the collecting ducts. So let's actually zoom in, take a look at some of those, see what we can see. Uh, let's actually zoom in a few right here. You can even start to see the pattern of these collecting ducts. Notice that all the collecting ducts are kind of going almost in a striated fashion toward this region right here. You see everything's kind of wisping toward that, even from this side over here. That's what we see when we're looking at the area of the collecting duct. Let's continue to zoom in. And again, what we'll see are these wisps. Here's a good region right here. If you're ever looking at the, if you know you're looking at the, uh, at the, the kidneys, microscope image, and you see these wisps like this, each one of these kind of white areas right here, that is the lumen of a collecting duct. Okay. In fact, if we zoom in far enough, we can even see the cells that line at these epithelial cells. Okay. So these are the collecting ducts. Okay. We zoom in or zoom out a lot more. Let's actually go back here. This region over here where we see the convergence of all these collecting ducts, this right here is probably the papillary region of the renal pyramid. Okay. It's probably what this is. And then this would eventually merge into a or move into a minor calyx, and then of course the major calyx in the renal pelvis. But when you see this pattern right here, this is gonna be the all the collecting ducts that are sort of merging towards that papilla of the renal pyramid. Okay. So hopefully uh, all the physiology and then this histology made sense to you. Um, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.